Acrocanthosaurus was as big and certainly as deadly as the more famous Tyrannosaurus rex, yet remains all but unknown to the world. Well, not anymore. This creature was a beast, a real carnivorous giant, and its time in the shadows is done. As a genus of large carcharodontosaurid theropod dinosaur, Acrocanthosaurus lived in North America during the early Cretaceous period. It dates back to approximately 112 million years ago. The name Acrocanthosaurus translates to high-spined lizard, and for good reason, but we'll get to that in a minute. Back in the 1940s, when scientists first stumbled upon its bones, they knew they'd found something extraordinary, but they didn't quite grasp the full scale of this dinosaur size until the 1990s, when they uncovered more complete skeletons. That's when they realized just how massive these creatures were. Some of them, measuring over 38 feet in length, were even longer than your regular city bus. And by these measurements, it's clear that they were almost as big as some of the famous T-Rex specimens, like Titus and Stan. Now, while the Acrocanthosaurus was pretty heavy, it wasn't as bulky as the T-Rex. It was more slender and less robust, which made it a bit lighter, although exactly how much lighter is still up for debate among paleontologists. Originally, they thought it weighed about 4.5 tons, but recent studies have given us a weight range of between 3.6 and 5.5 tons. Some even speculate it could have tipped the scales at over 6 tons. Now that's as bulky as an African bush elephant. But it's not just its size that makes Acrocanthosaurus so fascinating. That'd be the fact that this dinosaur was the apex predator of its time. This meant it could hunt down a variety of prey. It liked to sneak up on its prey in open, dry spots or by riverbeds, and its prey included smaller plant-eating dinos, like Tenontosaurus. But its menu also included ornithopods, ankylosaurus, and even sauropods. Yep, those massive, long-necked dudes. And how do we know that? Well, they found sauropod bones with bite marks that looked just like those made by an Acrocanthosaurus. It seems like this beast wasn't afraid to take on the big guys. It's believed it might have targeted sauropods like Astrodon and maybe even the colossal Sauroposeidon. But if it was smart, it probably didn't go after the adults, just the youngsters or weaker ones. Now, you might wonder, how on earth did this giant dinosaur manage to take down such huge prey? Well, if you look at the bite marks they found, it's pretty clear that its mouth played a big role. This guy wasn't just all brawn and no brain. It was equipped with some serious weapons, starting with its mouth. Acros had rows of these massive, dagger-like teeth, all serrated and curved, perfect for slicing through flesh like a hot knife through butter. And when it grabbed its prey and chomped down, it could unleash a bite force of around 16,900 newtons at its max. That's like eight times stronger than a black bear's bite. Yeah, its mouth would be a horrible place to die. Now, you might think with all that power, its head must have been huge, right? Well, yeah, it was pretty massive, about four feet long. But even though it was big, it was still pretty nimble. See, it had a narrow skull with a big opening in front of its eyes, which actually made it lighter compared to other big predator skulls, so it could easily swing that head around when it was going in for the kill. The Acrocanthosaurus wasn't just relying on its powerful jaws, though. It had two beefy forelimbs, too. Paleontologists have noticed they were well-built and super muscular. So, while its bite was deadly, these strong arms came in handy when it was trying to take down something as massive as a sauropod. Furthermore, when scientists examined the arm bones of the Acrocanthosaurus, they noticed something interesting. A lot of the joints didn't quite fit together snugly, suggesting there was a good amount of cartilage present. This got researchers thinking that maybe this dino relied heavily on its arms. Now, these arms weren't long enough for walking around, so it's likely they were used for something else. Like, you know, hunting. Each hand had three super sharp claws, with the first one being the biggest. While most scientists agree that these arms were definitely used for hunting, exactly how they were used is still a bit of a mystery. Same goes for its mouth. There are a bunch of theories floating around about how it hunted. One of the most popular theories suggests that since its arms didn't reach out that far, the Acrocanthosaurus probably went in for the kill head first. It would latch onto its prey with those massive jaws. And then, just to make sure its dinner didn't get away, it would use those sharp claws to hook into its victim. 
it was a double whammy of doom for whatever unfortunate creature crossed its path. Additionally, there's this idea that when dealing with medium-sized prey, Acro would use its arms to pull the animal towards its body. But with larger prey, it might have done the opposite, pulling itself towards the animal and then going in for those fatal bites. Some people have even come up with more imaginative theories, like suggesting it pushed animals over with its arms. But that's a bit far-fetched, considering its sturdy legs were more suited for balancing, indicating it likely faced prey that was on its feet and moving around. Now, some scientists think this dinosaur might have been a pack hunter. This theory comes from a famous set of footprints found in the Glenrose trackway. They showed theropod tracks, possibly belonging to Acrocanthosaurus, moving alongside 12 sauropods. This led to the idea that these dinosaurs hunted in packs. But that's not all there is to the story. Compared to the big, dramatic dinosaur skeletons you see in museums, fossil footprints might seem kind of plain. But this particular set of footprints found in Texas were straight out of a dinosaur movie. Back in 1938, a paleontologist named Roland T. Bird heard about some giant dinosaur tracks near a river in Texas. He found a bunch of them, but one spot was really interesting. They were the footprints of a massive long-necked sauropod dinosaur, followed closely by three-toed footprints of a predator, probably an Acrocanthosaurus. It looked like the predator was tracking the sauropod, and there was even a moment where it seemed the predator had attacked the herbivore, leaving behind a little hop in its tracks. Bird dug up this trackway, and part of it is now displayed at the American Museum of Natural History, New York. Now, there's some debate about what exactly happened here. Did the predator really attack the sauropod, or is it just a coincidence that their footprints are so close together? Some experts went back to Bird's notes and the evidence from the trackway to try and figure it out. They noticed some interesting details, like how both dinosaurs followed the same path and made a sudden turn together. Plus, there's this drag mark made by the sauropod's foot, hinting that maybe it was struggling or trying to avoid an attack. Another one of its most obvious features was its neural spines. These elongated spines ran down its neck, back, hips, and part of its tail, sticking out like well, spikes on a dinosaur. Now, these spines were more than twice the length of the vertebrae they were attached to, which is pretty wild. They weren't as crazy long as the Spinosaurus' spines, but they still caught a lot of attention and even played a part in naming the dinosaur. Like we pointed out in the beginning, Acrocanthosaurus actually means high spine lizard, but scientists aren't exactly sure what these spines looked like in real life. Did they create a little sail or hump on its back? Well, some recent studies suggest they were probably packed with muscle. This leads experts to think they might have formed more of a hump or ridge. Now, as for what they were for, well, that's still up for debate too. Some think they could have been used for communication, controlling body temperature, storing fat, or even intimidating rivals. Whatever their purpose, one thing's for sure, those spines didn't hold back the Acrocanthosaurus. It was the top predator in North America during the early Cretaceous period, ruling over places like Texas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming like a true king. It's possible that it had an even broader territory than we initially thought. There's some partial evidence suggesting its presence in Maryland too. Now, being the top predator of its time had its perks. Since it was the biggest carnivore around, it could roam through a variety of environments, but it seemed to have a soft spot for places near water. In Texas, for example, it rested in floodplains and mudflats close to the coastline. And during its reign, Texas was partly underwater. So, the Acrocanthosaurus would have been right at home in these watery habitats. Thanks to its wide distribution, it shared its habitat with a whole bunch of other dinosaurs, including some big names like Sauropelta, Tenontosaurus, Dromaeosaurus, and those sauropods we mentioned earlier. It also coexisted with non-dino pals like crocodiles, mammals, fish, lizards, and turtles. But of course, none of these other creatures, especially the carnivores, came close to matching the size of the Acrocanthosaurus. Now, being the big boss didn't mean it was invincible. Some specimens have been found with damage to their skulls and neural spines, but we're not exactly sure what caused it. It could have been battles with other Acrocanthosaurus, or maybe struggles with large prey. This guy finds its place in the dinosaur family tree within the superfamily Allosauridae. Now, this superfamily has some unique characteristics. 
like paired ridges on the nasal and lacrimal bones on the snout, and those tall spiky bits on the neck vertebrae, among other stuff. When it comes to family ties, Acrocanthosaurus was originally thought to be part of the Allosauridae family, but as more research rolled in, most studies lean towards it being a member of the Carcharodontosauridae family. It was probably present in Africa as well, as with some Giganotosaurus from South America. Some even think Acro might be related to another dino called Eocarcaria, also from Africa. However, Neoventor, found in England, might be even more closely related to Acro, or it could even be part of a different dino family called Neovenatoridae. So, what does this all mean? Well, if Acrocanthosaurus was indeed a Carcharothontosaurid, it suggests that this dino family started out in Europe and then spread out to places like Africa, South America, and even North America during the early to Middle Cretaceous period. The first remains of Acrocanthosaurus were discovered in 1940 near Atoka, Oklahoma, by J. Willis Stovall and Wayne Langston, Jr. Other fossils have been found in Texas, Utah, and possibly Maryland. However, the most complete skeleton was found by amateur paleontologists Cephas Hall and Sid Love in 1983, less than 20 miles from the Museum of the Red River. This find was groundbreaking, as it included over 50% of the fossil, including the entire skull. However, the fossil was incredibly fragile. Unlike typical prehistoric remains, which are often replaced by stable quartz compounds, this specimen was composed of iron and sulfur compounds, like marcasite and pyrite. Marcasite crumbles in open air when in a non-crystalline state, while pyrite can emit sulfuric acid fumes when removed. The high humidity levels worsened the fragility of the fossil. At this point, some help was needed. So, Hall and Love took the help of Allen and Fran Grafham of Geological Enterprises in Ardmore. With their assistance, the remains were transferred to the Black Hills Institute for Geological Research in South Dakota. The institute then constructed a dedicated lab space for the fragile fossil, ultimately saving it a few years later. After that, the fossil was sold to the North Carolina Museum of Natural History. Sadly, despite all its strengths as an apex predator, the Acrocanthosaurus eventually faded away before the late Cretaceous period and before the rise of the T-Rex. It's a shame, because it would have been pretty cool to see how these two giants would have interacted if they ever crossed paths. But in the end, it remains to be said that Acro, with its towering spinal ridges and formidable size, stands as a true example of how diverse these dinosaurs really were. Its unique features and role as a top predator in prehistoric North America really makes you think how different the world was back in the Mesozoic era. And that's a wrap. Do you think Acrocanthosaurus could probably take down a full-size T-Rex? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.